Fletcher on interfaces. Landry, Austin, Dylan, Lane. He looked up and Philip and South Park was one of the guys. Sydney, <laughs> Catherine, Tania. I should say it one last time. This is probably the last last class you're gonna have. Tania, <laughs> Taylor, <laughs> Bailey, Benoit, Clint, Karina, Mana, Trevor, Zaid, uh, Allison. Craig, Sonia, Rama, Alexandria, yeah. oops, Venkata, Anthony, Anthony, Wong, Brooke, Jarrett, Frank, here, Eric, here, Stephen, Gabrielle, Amelia, here. Jeffrey, yeah. Andrew, Jason, LaShawn, Sean, and Haley. Did I miss anybody? All right. Let's go ahead and get started on that last lecture that I know you're dying to hear. Okay, so we talked about inheritance, okay? We talked about the extends clause and everything that goes along with the extends clause. Now we're going to talk about the implements clause that also goes in a class declaration, okay? And that leads to the discussion of interfaces. So the problem with, with what we've discussed so far is that a class can inherit directly only from one class. So my music store can only be a store, right? My uh, web store can only be a store. My grocery store can only be a store, right? What if I want to extend from multiple things? C++ allows you to extend from as many classes as you want, but that leads to all kinds of problems. Okay? Java fixed these problems okay, by introducing interfaces, and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay? We're not going to talk about the C++ specifics that make it an absolute tragedy when you try to extend multiple classes. Okay? We're just going to talk about how Java does it. Okay? So to allow a class to inherit behavior from multiple sources, Java provides what's called the interface, okay? So an interface typically specifies behavior that a class will implement. Notice that it only specifies behavior. It doesn't say how to actually do anything. It just specifies this behavior exists, okay? So we've introduced two new Java keywords. They are the interface and implements, okay? There's a lot of details here, uh, but what really matters here is that interface members can be any of the following. You only need to worry about constants, okay? They, can, they, they include constants, because constants never change, okay? And public abstract methods, okay? So all of the methods in an interface need to be abstract, all right? That means that they don't have any implementation details, all right? That's what makes uh, an, uh, inheriting from multiple interfaces safe, but inheriting from multiple classes unsafe, okay? So once again, I'm gonna ask this, ask this on the test. So um, Java only allows you to extend one class, yeah? Okay? But you can implement as many interfaces as you want. Okay? Don't even worry about those other types, types of methods. To define an interface is really, really easy. Okay? Instead of saying public class class name, you just say public interface interface name. That was really hard. Okay? When you first write an interface, I'm going to warn you, it's going to look wrong, okay? Because probably an interface is not more than, say, 20 lines long, whereas a class can be pages and pages and pages long, okay? Um, if you Java doc an interface fully, well, then maybe it'll be 35 lines long, right? It's not going to be a big thing because you're just going to list some constants, okay? And then you're going to have public abstract methods 
And abstract methods, remember, don't have any implementation details, right? They just end in a semicolon, okay? So it's kind of like listing all of the prototypes if you're used to C, right? That's all it is, yeah? Okay? You all okay with that prototype terminology? I just pulled that out of, out of the air. If you had 13, 15, then you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so all interfaces are abstract because they can only have abstract things in them, right? Um, so you're allowed to say just public interface interface name rather than public abstract interface interface name. You can do it either way, whatever you prefer. Okay? But you can leave the abstract keyword out of the definition. So again, defining an interface is really easy, right? Yeah? Okay. We need to talk about fields and we need to talk about methods, right? Within an interface. So an interface's fields are automatically public, static, and final. The important one that really matters to you there is final, okay? That means that every field in an interface has to be a constant, yeah? Okay? Um, because they're all public, static, and final, you can specify public, static, and final, or you can omit them. It doesn't really matter, okay? It's just a preference, okay? So whenever you define a field in an interface, because it's a constant, you have to give it a value, right? Yeah? We never <coughs> define constants without values in this class, right? Okay? That's it for fields. Basically, they're all constants, right? Okay? Let's talk about methods. In later versions of Java, there's a lot of extra things that you can add to an interface, but I only want you to be worried about the abstract methods, okay? Interfaces always uh, contain these abstract methods, okay? Um, and like all abstract methods, they have to be the method definition and then a semicolon, right? You can't have any impl implementation details because that's what abstract means. It means it's missing the details, right? So you can't put any details there. Okay? So obviously we can't implement an interface, right? We can't instantiate an interface, okay? Because it's abstract. So it's only useful when we extend from it, right? Okay? So how do you go about extending, uh, well, I'm sorry, implementing an interface, okay? Well, you just do public class and then the class name, extends and then the super class name, just like always. And then if you're going to implement interfaces, you just say implements and then you list the interface names. It's really easy, right? Okay. Just like inheritance itself is really easy because it's just extends super class, right? Now you can implement these interfaces as well. Okay. So. Obviously, you don't have an extends clause if you don't have a superclass or if you want the superclass to be object. Okay, you can leave out the extends clause if you don't have it. Um, you can implement zero, one, or more interfaces. Okay, um, obviously, if you're going to implement zero, you just leave off this implements. Yeah, <clears throat> if you only have one, you just do implements interface one. Okay. Uh, if you have multiple, then you comma separate them. Yeah? So you don't have to say implements interface one, implements interface two, implements interface three. No. You just say implements and then you comma list them. Right? Okay? Just like with everything that's abstract, when you implement an interface, you have to declare an implementation for each of those abstract things. Right? or else you your ha yourself have to be abstract, right? Okay. Same thing as uh, when you extend from a class. Okay, this next example is six slides long and it's really, really uh, convoluted example. So I'm gonna wait and give you an example of an interface uh, with a simpler example that comes a little bit later, okay? I'm just skipping this example because it's a lot. I mean a lot. A lot. A lot. Okay. So, uh, where abstract 
methods, and oh, I'm sorry, or abstract classes, and therefore also interfaces, really come into their own, where they're really useful, is when you use them polymorphically. Okay? An interface can be used polymorphically just like any abstract class. Okay? Remember, in our example, okay, store was an abstract class, right? We made an array list of stores. Remember that? Okay? We couldn't instantiate store, right? But each one of those references could then point to any subclass of store, right? You can do the, same, the exact same thing with interfaces, all right? So if I had an interface named payable, for instance, because interface names tend, tend to be adjectives, okay? So if I, had, um, if I had an interface named payable, okay, that payable array list could have anything that's payable in it, right? It have employees, it could have bills, it could have invoices, it could have whatever, right? Yeah? Okay. Anything that implements the payable interface has an is a relationship, just like store and all of its subclasses did. All right. So yeah, and you you, you run them just the same way that you would um, you would polymorphism with the class. So let me give you an example. Okay. This is a pretty realistic example, except for there's only three shipping strategies, but let me, let, me, let me talk about it, okay? So assume that we're a company like Amazon. Yes? Okay. Uh, we want, we're a company that wants to calculate uh, shipping costs for items our customers buy. Yeah, at some point Amazon had to do that, right? Yeah? Because they tend to ship a few things every once in a while? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to assume that we have three pricing strategies, right? We have flat rate shipping, which is just you take the number of pounds and you multiply it by some number, and that's your rate. That's your shipping cost, right? That's a flat rate. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to do standard shipping. This is like slow shipping, right? Then we're going to do standard shipping, where you have a base rate for the first five pounds, and then an additional rate for each additional pound. Okay? Then we're going to do express shipping, which just means we're going to ship it faster, okay? Where you have the standard shipping and plus a fixed fee. All right? Okay? So we have shipping that's based on my weight, shipping that is based on my weight for a set amount, right? And then additional fee. And then we have express, which is standard plus an express rate. Yeah? Okay? Don't, I mean, these details here don't matter. What matters is the inheritance that I'm about to show you. So the first thing that we do is we make an interface called shipping costs. Okay? So everything that I'm going to ship is going to have a shipping cost. Right? This is actually the entire Java code for this interface. I told you, they're very short. Right? We can add javadoc to it, but that's really it. Right? Okay? So we have our public interface shipping costs, and anything that has a shipping cost should know how to calculate your shipping costs. Yeah? Okay? Um, in order to figure out how to calculate my shipping costs, I take a weight, the weight of the item, and I return the costs. Okay? Yeah? Okay, now we're going to derive three classes that implement this interface and talk about my uh, shipping costs, all right? So let's take a look. So at the top of my hierarchy, I've got my uh, interface shipping costs, okay? Um, and again, I'm just saying that everything that has a shipping cost should be able to figure out its shipping costs by calculating shipping, right? Okay? It doesn't know how to do it for a general shipping cost, right? But it should know how to do it if it is a subclass of this, right? Okay, so I subclass this using implements into flat rate shipping, okay? Flat rate shipping costs, uh, adds the constant rate per pound, okay? And it knows how to calculate its shipping based on uh, the double that we pass it and the rate per pound, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? 
We can further in, uh, extend my shipping costs into my standard shipping, okay? Remember with standard shipping, you have a base cost, right? And then an extra fee per pound, right? Okay, so you have your base weight, okay, which is five pounds, right? And then we have a base charge, which is that first five pounds, right? And then the extra pound rate. Well, given those constants and the double, which is the weight of our, my package, okay, I can now calculate my shipping, right? Okay. Then I can even extend my standard shipping into express shipping because express shipping only does standard shipping plus a fee, right? Yeah. Okay. So I just have a constant for how much is the fee, right? And then I can calculate my shipping, right? This is actually going to call super dot calculate shipping to do its job, right? So it's going to look at this guy and then add the fee to it, right? Okay. The only non-cost is the Right. Okay. Now, how do we actually go about using this if we are Amazon, right? Okay. So we might have a separate class for every shipping strategy. Now, there might be a ton more of them, right? There might be FedEx, USPS, um, uh, DHL, you know, whatever, right? Right? Um, and American Express might have multiple modes. So you might have, you know, 20 of these or so, right? Yeah. So what we do is in the client, okay, we define a reference to just shipping costs, just the interface, right? Which is just that simple little one abstract method, right? Okay? When the client says what type of shipping they want, oh, well then we can instantiate that kind of class, right? And we can store it in shipping costs because everything that has a shipping cost should be a uh, subclass of shipping costs, right? So if they want uh, flat rate shipping, okay, I make a new flat rate shipping and I store it in shipping costs, right? If they want, I don't know, express shipping, I make a new express shipping uh, class and I store it in shipping costs, right? Okay? And that allows it to, to perform polymorphically. So once I finally know the weight of their package, because they're going to go through and select all kinds of things and add it to the package, right? Yeah? Once I finally know the weight of the package, I can just do this shipping cost, right? Dot calculate shipping. And it will automatically call the right one. Yeah? Polymorphically. That's it. Any questions before I start the exam review? Or you want to get to the exam review? The exam review. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> Those are rhetorical questions. All right. So this, this final exam review, remember that I'm not going to ask you the actual questions. OK? I'm going to modify the questions. I'm going to change their order. I'm going to change variable names. These are just representative of the questions, OK? Mm -hmm. I would encourage you not to take videos of this or pictures of this. You can if you want to. I'm not going to yell at you much. Um, but really what I want you to do is understand the answers to all of these questions. If you develop that understanding, okay, then you'll be able to answer these questions and a heck of a lot more. right? It's really about that understanding. Now, if you need to take pictures of individual slides, I understand, all right? But we are going to reason our way through all of these questions. Yes? Yeah? yeah. Remember, these are not the actual test questions, okay? So if you see a question that looks a lot like something that I go over, you better read the question carefully to make sure of what it's asking, right? So it might be the exact same question, but it might ask you for the value of a different variable at the end. Okay, please, please pay attention to the questions, all right? All right, that's your only warning. <laughs>
It's kind of funny how this starts. So it says it's questions one through three, and there's four questions. Um, the first question is just kind of a lead-in, okay? Um, it's, the, it's the last three here that are going to be actual test questions, or close to test questions, okay? Okay, so how many classes can a class extend? One, okay? Your extends can only have one target. It has zero targets and you just don't have an extends clause, right? By the way, if you don't explicitly say, I'm extending from this class, what do you extend from? Super Object, close. right? Okay. All right. How many, so that was the lead in question two. How many interfaces can a class implement? Well, any non negative number, right? Zero, one, two, or more, right? Yeah? Any whole number, how's that? Okay, we just covered that. This one goes back in time a little bit. What do illegal operations generate in Java? What do we call that thing that gets thrown when we, uh, when we do something illegal in Java? Exceptions. Yeah? What Java keyword is used in a class header when a class is defined as inheriting from an interface? We just went over this. Implements. Implements. Okay? Yeah? Don't worry, there won't be as many interface questions as we go through this. Uh, I know there are two out of three so far, but um, that's just a minor thing that we're covering. Everybody good so far? Okay, questions four and five, I don't really have a good way to, uh, to represent to you um, because they're code questions and you're supposed to interpret code. They're very similar to what you did in 10Q2. So you should make sure they're in the same package. <laughs> um, you mark, 10Q2, which you just did, right? Yeah? So you're very much just going to run, run well, you're going to simulate running some code, right? And you're going to tell me what the output is. So these questions, these two questions, will require you to determine which method will be called from a class and that class is going to extend from another class, okay? Remember that if I redefine that method in the subclass, it replaces that previous method completely. It doesn't do that anymore. Right? Okay? On the other hand, if I don't redefine it exactly, okay, then that method just gets inherited and I can still call it. Right? Okay? Those are your hints for that one. When you're doing these two questions, please make sure that you pay attention to the code that calls the methods. Make sure you're answering it for the right question. Right? Okay? All right. Does Java often use exceptions when reading from or writing to files? Yeah, it does. Remember? Um, that's really the only context we've even seen exceptions in, right? Um, the truth is, exceptions pop up all the time, but. Um, yeah, they, they're integral to uh, reading and writing from files, okay? So the answer to that is yes, okay? Should variable names begin with a lowercase letter? That's like from the very first day of this class, right? Yes. Um, variable names should be in camel case, which automatically starts with a lowercase letter, right? Yeah? What about method names? Should they start with a lowercase letter? Yes. Yes, always. What about constructor names? Should they start off with a lowercase letter? No. No, because constructors have to have the exact same name as a class, right? Good. How should a constructor, <laughs> wow, I just answered this. How should a constructor be named? has to have the same name as a class. There is no how should it be named. It has to be named 
the exact same name as the class. What's its return type? None, not void, right? Constructors have no return type. Yes? How do instance variables in a class usually get initialized? When the constructor is called. That's what the constructor is for. That's the whole job of the constructor, right? Um, from a purely problem solving point of view, right? The purpose of a constructor is to set up the instance variables so that they're in a valid state, right? That's what it does, right? What is typically the return type of an accessor? Your accessors are your getters, right? So they have whatever, uh, whatever type the variable is that you're getting, right? Yeah? Yeah? So if you're getting an int, it's going to be a, an int, right? If you're getting a double, it's going to be a double. If you're getting a char, it's going to be a char. If you're getting a salamander, it's going to be a salamander, right? Yeah? And that's a possibility in Java now, right? We can make a class called salamander, right? Heck yeah, we can! We're going to find our own salamanders all day long. Like God of Java. Okay. All right. Where can you uh, access instance variables and met... Oh, this is a tricky one. Where can you access instance variables and methods within a class? The key word there is instance met, uh, variables and instance methods. Where are you allowed to access things? Huh? Yeah, but the scope is everything. It's the whole class. So let me, let me rephrase this question. Where are you not allowed to access instance variables and instance methods? Outside the class. Well, I don't know. Instance methods, you access those outside the class all the time. You're getting, you're getting there outside of static methods, right? Right? Because static can't assume that you already have an instance to work with. Remember that? Okay? Yeah? You might call get count, right? You've, well, count is still zero. You haven't even instantiated one yet, right? So you can only access instance variables and instance methods outside of static methods. Yeah? This will be a multiple choice question, so that will be a lot easier for you, okay? Um, this is all multiple choice, yeah? Unless there's extra credit. I can't remember if there's extra credit on this final or not. If there is extra credit, I have to grade that by hand, okay? What does the keyword private mean? It means that you can only access it in, in that class. Yes? Yeah? What is the purpose of instance variables? They hold the state of the class, right? Like a student, for instance, has an ID number, a GPA, a number of hours, right? That all defines the state of that student, right? What does the keyword final mean when it precedes a variable name? It means it's a constant, right? It can't be changed is really what final means, but that effectively means it's a constant, right? Am I going too fast? In a typical class, how should you use access modifiers? What are the two access modifiers that, I, that I'm really focused on? Public and private. What should be public? Getters and setters. And Not just data, getters and setters. And data manipulation methods. Yeah, pretty much all of the methods and constructors, right? What should be private? The fields that are not constants, right? Okay. So the answer here is your uh, non-constant fields, 
should be private, and everything else should be public. Okay? In general. Yeah? I think next semester in data structures, you might start to see some private methods and things like that. And we'll talk about why that is. Yeah? But in general, that's true. Okay? Let's pretend that we have written a class named tire, which represents tires. That's complicated. Yeah? Okay? So we have a tire class. Is it possible to have an instance variable in car of type tire? Yes. Yeah. In fact, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah? Tires have all sorts of information about them. They have a wear amount, they have um, a, a recommended pressure, they have a maximum pressure, they have where their holes are, right? All of that kind of thing. Those, that has to be grouped together in a class, right? Well, obviously a car has tires, so you have an is a relationship, right? That's what you're supposed to do, okay? So a car has five tires, right? Okay. So, spare. You're looking at me like I'm weird. Um, but yeah, car has five tires, right? So you would just make those data members. Do mutator methods typically take a parameter? Yeah, they do. In fact, every single one of the dozens of them that we've written this semester took a parameter, right? Yeah? Because they're supposed to set something to some value. I need to know what that some value is, right? Yeah? You guys are awfully quiet. <laughs> you okay? Yes. Fantastic. We're good. All right. In terms of naming, what are the key differences between a mutator, an accessor, and a constructor? Okay. So how's a mutator named? Set. Set variable name, right? How is an accessor named? Get variable name. Uh, how's a constructor named? That's the exact same name as the class. Has the same name as the class. What is the return type of a mutator? Void. Usually void. Uh, what is the return type for an accessor? The same. The same as the variable that you're getting. What is the return type for a constructor? It doesn't have a return. Doesn't type. have one. Okay? You should be able to answer those right off the top of your head, right? Because I'm telling you, for every single class that you write as a professional programmer, you're going to have getters and setters. All right? You're going to just be in the habit of being able to write those like it's nobody's business. And of course, if you're using Eclipse, you can just go to the source menu. For you, right? But you still need to understand it, right? And we did that, of course, in chapter seven. Ooh, this is a hard one too. What are the restrictions and the benefits of static methods? So let's start with a the major restriction of a static method. We talked about it before. So what's the restriction of a static method? That's right. Very good. The only variables it can use are static variables, right? It can't access instance variables or instance methods. Yeah? Okay. What is the benefit of using a static method? Well, so can instance methods. You can use it without having to create an object. There you go. You can use it without an object instance to call it on, right? Think about it, that's why our mains are always static, because we want the JVM to be able to call our method without having to instantiate one of those objects first. Right? Yeah? I promise there's not too many questions on static either. But I also promise you that you should definitely run into static methods next semester too, in data structures, okay? For those of you, how many of you are taking data structures? Okay, not that many. 
Can file contents be converted to a stream? Yes. Yes, they can. Uh, we do that when we make our scanner off of a file, right? That's a stream. Okay? When we open a file for reading and the file does not exist, what happens? It throws an exception, right? What type of exception? A file not found exception, which is a type of, you might, may not know this, I.O. exception, which is a type of exception, right? Yeah? So see how that, that polymorphic behavior comes into play all over the place? Okay? But basically, yeah, an exception is generated. Okay, questions 28 and 29. are also code, so I can't really just give that to you. Um, but basically, you're going to be presented with code that reads from a file, and you have to interpret that code. So I'm going to give you the file listing, and I'll give you the code that's supposed to read it, and you're supposed to tell me what it does. Okay? What you need to remember to get these correct is that any exception that recurs as a result of input or output will either be an I.O. exception or it'll extend to I.O. exception, okay? So it's either going to be an I.O. exception or it's going to be like a file not found exception, for instance, that extends it, okay? That's not a big deal, but you do need to remember when, that when an exception is generated by a try block, you immediately exit that method, right, and you go to wherever that is thrown, okay? You never come back, right? Okay? Yeah? Okay? Sorry. Thank you. Push the knob. All right. What is a, the major benefit of inheritance other than polymorphism? So polymorphism is a big deal. Reusing what it, code? What, yeah. Basically, you don't have to rewrite any code, right? Yeah? So you put the code in one thing, you put it in the superclass, and it's just automatically inherited um, throughout. Yeah? Okay. What exactly does a subclass inherit from its superclass? Remember that a class can only have four things. Let's try this first. What are the four things that a class can have? Fields, constructors, Static initializers, which we haven't even talked about, and, and methods, okay? Which of those things get inherited? Fields and methods, okay? And don't worry, it's multiple choice, and the, uh, the choices don't include, like, static initializer or constructor, okay? Yeah? This is an easy one. You better be able to get this one. What is the name of the one class that is a superclass of all other classes? Object. Object. That's why it's an object-oriented language. Funny how that works. What key, this is another easy one. What keyword best summarizes inheritance in Java? Keyword, it's a word in the language. Extends. Extends. Yeah, or super. Super would work too. But I'm looking for extends. Super won't be an option. <laughs> yeah? Whew. How many classes can a, can, a, can a Java class inherit from directly? One. One. Okay, you can only extend one thing. How many classes can a Java class inherit from indirectly? There's no limit, right? Okay, depends on how deep you are in the R, right? Yeah. As an example, file not found exception extends uh, I/O exception, but it's an, it's got indirect superclasses of exception and throwable and object, right? Okay. So it's just a matter of where it falls on the R. There's no limit. In Java, what is the name of the structure that allows multiple inheritance? Inheritance. 
an interface. Just covered that, guys. Come on now. In Java, how many classes can a class implement? As many as it wants. No. Just one. No! That's right. It can implement zero. Because implements is only used with interfaces. interfaces, not with classes. Frick question. Yeah? If a class contains an abstract method, what keyword must be used to describe the class? Abstract. Abstract. Because if you have an abstract method, that means that you have to be abstract. You have to say, I'm missing some details. Right? Yeah? You guys are not enjoying this enough. We're almost done, actually. Okay, questions 37, 38, and 39 are interpreting the code again. Yeah? Okay. So, you'll be given classes in an inheritance relationship and asked what happens when, it, when you write, when you call some overwritten method. Okay? So, think about two string, right? Object itself has a two string, store had a two string, and then music store, for instance, had its own two string. Right? That's the kind of thing I'm going to set up for you. Right? What you need to remember is that if you need to call the super classes two string, you just call super dot two string, right? That immediately goes to the super class and calls that method, right? Please nod. Okay, thank you. And uh, in a constructor, when you call super, you're really just accessing super constructors, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, you know, what is the output of this? This will be very similar to what happened in Q2, right? Yeah? So I'm going to give you, you know, the, I'm running these four lines. What is the output, right? So, yeah? Whee! 40 through 44! A lot of questions. How do you go about instantiating an object from an abstract class? Huh? You can't. Yeah. You have to extend it first. But you can't instantiate an abstract class. Period. You just can't do it. Right? Yeah? I can't make a class of type shipping costs or a class of type store. Right? Right? How does polymorphism simplify programming? I'm not going to torture you by trying to come up with an answer for this. So it's just uh, you're going to call multiple methods by just calling one method, right? Yes? So you're going to say the name of the method, and you're going to call any number of methods based on that one function call, right? It might be the version of two string that's in music store, or in web store, or in grocery store, or in bookstore, or in any number of stores, right? But I'm just calling two string, yeah? Okay, assume that you've written a tire class. I don't know why I keep going back to this. Is it possible to create an array list of tires? Yes. 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 Uh, we did that with our array list of stores, right? We also did that with our array list of books, actually, right? I can't believe I even remember that. Yeah? When we had our bookstore, remember? We had an array list of books, okay? So it's perfectly legal. Yeah, you can make an array list of a user defined class, right? The next question is really simple. What package is ArrayList in? Java.util. It's in Java.util, right? You may not remember that, but it's a really simple question. Hmm. How do you typically access elements of an ArrayList? Get. Get what? 
what do you pass in to get? An index. An index, yeah. So you access them by index and then you use get, right? Yeah? As opposed to arrays where you use the square brackets, right? You just say get of i where i is the index. Yeah? Almost there. How many constructors can a class have? At least one. One or more. That's true. Uh, it has to have one, even if you don't define it. Mm -hmm. But how many? Is there a limit? No. No, there's no limit, right? When can a method of a class access the variables of a class? So let's just say I'm in my store class and I'm inside of a method in that. Am I allowed to access my instance variables? Yeah, I'm allowed to. So always. Yeah? I don't think that question is phrased that way. But yeah, uh, inside of a class, you can always access the instance variables of a class. Oh, easy one. How are accessor methods named? Get variable name. What happens when we do not provide a constructor for our class? We get a deep. That's function. what ends up happening. Yeah, but. Right? That's kind of secondary when I run it. When I don't define one, Java provides the default constructor for me. Yeah? So you're not wrong. You're just not right. <laughs> That's a middle ground. Accessor methods typically take how many parameters? None. None. Yeah, you don't need to know anything, right? If I just need to, to get my count, right? I don't need to pass it anything, right? They typically take zero. Okay, when does an array list expand automatically? Let me rephrase that. When does an array list automatically expand? Whenever it needs to. Whenever it needs to, yeah. Whenever it's out of space. When does it automatically contract or reduce its size? Automatically. Oh. It, it doesn't do that, right? Unless you call trim. Yeah. I knew that's what you were thinking, but yeah. it doesn't do it automatically. You have to tell it that you want to trim it. What is, how many times have I asked this? What is the return type of a constructor? It doesn't have a return None. type. None. It doesn't have one. When can a method API, API means application programmer interface, be followed by a semicolon? When it's abstract. Yep. Because abstract means I'm missing details, right? So I just don't put the details. Yeah, why are you still here? Get out. <laughs> no. Y'all were great. I'm sorry this semester was such a mess with the fifth class and the almost 200 <laughs> students. But, and not to mention the last week of the class just missing, because this was 14 weeks instead of 15 weeks, and like nobody told me that was going to happen. Uh, but I did the best I could. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope that you're prepared to do object-oriented programming out there in the real world, and I hope to see most of you eventually in one of my gaming classes. So, or in the sequel to my gaming classes, as yeah. the case may be. Are there any questions? Okay, y'all have been great. Y'all have a great uh, vacation, a great Christmas, and don't forget the final exam, because that will ruin your Christmas.
Alright. See ya. See you that time. Thank you.